Good afternoon and welcome to EGU 22, the annual meeting of the European Geosciences Union. As many of you already know, this is the Union's first hybrid General Assembly, where we are bringing back our on-site experience for those joining us here in person, while at the same time introducing new concepts from the last couple of years to include our virtual attendees as much as possible. This year, we've had more than 12,000 abstracts submitted to EGU's meeting, and during the press conferences, we'd like to highlight some of the most unique studies, which, as you'll soon see, have impacts on local communities, industries, ecosystems, and the global environment. I'm Gillian D'Souza, EGU's Media and Communications Officer, and I'll be hosting this week's press conferences. Each press conference will have time for speakers to make their presentations, followed by a question and answer period at the end. For those of you joining us virtually, I ask that you all mute your mics throughout the briefing until I call upon you to speak. If you experience any technical difficulties, you can try to rejoin the session or look for more information on the press conferences section of the media.egu.eu page. A last few things to note, uh, please save all of your questions till after the speakers have finished presenting. During the Q&A period, we will take questions from journalists both in the room and online. If you're in the room, please raise your hand so we can pass a microphone over to you. And if you're joining virtually, you can use the hand raising function in Zoom or simply type your question into the chat. I'm now going to go ahead and introduce our panelists to make for faster transitions between them. This press conference is titled Omnipresent Plastics, Mountain Rivers to Microscopic Soils. Our speakers today are Lisa Watkins, from Cornell University, Ithaca, US, who is joining us virtually, followed by Marce Liro from the Institute of Nature Conservation, Polish Academy of Sciences, Poland, and Yung Shu Yu from the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences, Washington State University, US. Both Lisa and Marce are joining us virtually, and Ying Shu is present here on site. So we are now ready to begin, and we will start with Lisa's presentation, please. Yes, thank you, Jillian. And thanks for all of you being here today. Uh, I'm excited to share this work about plastic pollution. My name is Lisa Watkins. I recently received my PhD from Cornell University where I led the microplastics research team. And today I speak on behalf of myself and my colleague, Jordan Yu from an NGO called Chattahoochee Riverkeeper. With our research, we highlight one important way communities are already engaging in valuable work towards solving the plastic pollution problem, and we measure the scientific utility of their efforts. For this project, I've partnered with a community-facing NGO, Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, a member of the International Waterkeepers Alliance, who excels at education, outreach, lobbying, and stewardship of the Chattahoochee River in the southeastern United States. They operate a network of trash traps, like the one pictured, which capture all littered items as they float downstream. These traps are anchored on either side of a river of interest in public areas, where the public can see the accumulating items and make connections between the plastic they're using in their homes, litter they might observe on land, and water health of their local river. These are visual aids for the plastic pollution crisis, taking something easy to miss, a single bottle floating downstream and making it impossible to ignore. These traps are full after each and every rain event, urban litter in these rivers is so abundant. And Chattahoochee River Keeper isn't the only group managing traps like these. Around the world today, municipalities, nonprofits, other organizations are operating trash traps like these of a variety of designs and deployments to capture trash as it floats downstream and remove it from their favorite waterways. Beyond just capturing trash and the public's attention, a surprising number of these community facing organizations are also collecting data on the amounts and types of trash flowing down their rivers. And this is exactly the kind of information that scientists need to start nailing down exactly where floating trash is coming from and what interventions may work to stem the tide of the related macroplastics. 
but these community findings aren't regularly incorporated into plastic pollution research. My goal in this work was to first test the utility of these community data sets for growing scientific understanding of floating trash, specifically macroplastics, and then to highlight for researchers the work of these enthusiastic and careful stewards and the potential to advance plastic science while engaging the public by partnering in these efforts. Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, like others like it, follow very rigorous protocols. In their case, the US Environmental Protection Agency's Escaped Trash Assessment Protocol. And these methods of auditing what they've captured is what gives trash traps the potential to be used as scientific tools, despite the organization's often limited capacity internally to do anything with the data they're collecting. But the Riverkeepers generously and openly shared their data for me to be able to test just how useful it may be to scientific inquiry. And as a behind the scenes for you, the data I refer to is a huge folder of these handwritten data sheets pictured here. I assessed their data from over two years or 281 trap empties of the 11 traps that they manage located in six different tributaries throughout the Chattahoochee River watershed. And to be explicit, the novelty of this work is twofold. The first is the approach to the science, working in the style of community engaged science, which is where the community group, in this case, Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, was a partner in all this and not just a data source. From the start and throughout, we worked together to identify the questions and values of interest to them and had that guide the analysis. And the second is utilizing their data collected for their own purposes in a multi river network of trash traps in this way to learn about plastic pollution patterns. What they found collected in their traps is indeed largely plastic across those 281 trap empties and looking at the most common item types. Obviously, what they capture will be a type of plastic, but specifically, and to no surprise, it's single use items and packaging that's polluting these monitored rivers the most, and therefore should be targeted with interventions. And thanks to the detailed brand audit that the Riverkeeper performs at each trap empty, we could find that an impressive one fourth of all branded items collected in these trash traps were manufactured by a single company, Coca-Cola, a common name in litter across the globe, but one whose global headquarters ironically calls the Chattahoochee River watershed home. We can also use the detailed brand audits performed in the Riverkeepers protocols and learn that for brands associated with a location, so from a franchise or chain specifically, here we have from the left two fast food restaurants, a convenience store, a grocery um, chain, increased distance from the nearest fast food location is correlated with fewer associated items uh, in a given trap. In other words, these data indicate that items do not travel far from their source. And though plastics are flowing through these rivers to the extent that they fill a trash trap with every rainstorm, taking the mass captured in these traps and putting it in the context of the vast numbers of people living upstream in this urban area, the per person contribution is surprisingly low. Our data show that each person in the watershed contributes the equivalent of only one water bottle per person per year. Though there's some hand waving here as far as watershed scale transport of litter. To me, the message is that trying to reduce plastic pollution at the individual level, one annual water bottle intervention at a time, isn't the most efficient method of stemming the constant stream of trash in the river. It's going to take a broader systemic approach to address riverine plastic pollution. And it's exciting that this trash trap data from the community group can inform intervention strategies this way. The diversity of their trap placements also allowed for statistical analyses that pointed towards factors like precipitation, percent of water of the watershed that's paved, and the slope of the watershed as being significant predictors of trash load, which points to the ability of these community data sets to tell us about how trash is moving through the watershed and where it may be coming from. In all, what we're learning is that communities are already part of the solution to plastic pollution. Existing trash trapping programs are not only sparking an awareness in the public, 
but are also collecting what we find to be useful and relevant data for advancing the science on plastics. Data that tells us how much trash is moving, how far it's traveling, and what solutions targeting individuals' behavior, um, they, those types of solutions are insufficient at addressing the problem. And I'll end here by simply sharing that for an issue as fast growing and widespread as plastic pollution is, growing our scientific team to include organizations like Chattahoochee Riverkeeper, who are already excelling at energizing the community in the science and stewardship of local waters, can only serve to enrich our field and our science. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Lisa, for that very insightful presentation. We now move to Marche, who will um, present his slides, please. You hear me? Yes, we can hear you and we can see your slides, Marche. Okay, thank you for introduction. Uh, my name is Maciej Biro. I am assistant professor at the Institute of Nature Conservation of Polish Academy of Sciences. And since the last year, I was uh, conducting uh, the project about macroplastic pollution on multi rivers. Uh, today, I'm glad to present you some latest results of field work we have conducted in the mountain river in Polish Carpathian. Uh, in this research, we have focused on the process of macroplastic storage in a mountain river channel, which have not been explored so far. Um, mountain river are exciting ecosystems supporting high biodiversity, numerous ecosystem services, uh, and numerous goods for human, living not only in the mountain, but also downstream from this area. However, uh, recently, uh, mountain rivers became more and more polluted by plastic. As you can see on this map, this is the map showing the uh, amount of mismanaged plastic waste distributed along all water courses in Carpathian ecoregion. Uh, it is clearly seen that most of the stream, despite the fact that it is in mountain area, is significantly uh, affected by plastic pollution. Our study reach is indicated by blue arrow. Taking into account that each plastic item uh, disposed in riparian zone of river can be future transported and retained in the river in mainly unknown way. Uh, our, motivation, our motivation in this study was to answer the question uh, which element of a mountain river is most suitable for river cleaning action? And in different words, uh, which element of a mountain river is most polluted by macroplastic? Uh, to answer this question, uh, we have a sample macroplastic debris on different surfaces, uh, which are typical surfaces occurring on mountain rivers in, in uh, moderate climate. Next, we compare uh, the amounts of uh, macroplastic retained in channelized and multi thread reach of the Dunayet River in Polish Carpathian. This is typical uh, gravel bed mountain river. Uh, we use two types of morphological uh, <clears throat> patterns of river because we hypothesize that uh, unmanaged multi thread reach should retain significantly more macroplastic debris than the channelized one. Uh, this is because multi thread morphology supports numerous obstacles to the river flow, such as uh, wood jams and wooden islands, which can promote macroplastic retention in multi thread reach. Uh, based on our field sampling, we have found that the best macroplastic trap in the mountain river channel is wood jams, uh, which, which uh, retain 180 times higher amount of the 
macroplastic debris, then the exposed gravel sediments. And we also found that wooden islands have effectively trapped macroplastic debris. And its amounts found here was about 10 times higher than those found on the exposed sediments uh, not covered by any vegetation. Uh, this difference was uh, statistically significant. And next, we calculate total amount of the macroplastic debris uh, for both reaches. And we found that higher proportion of the surfaces which effectively trap macroplastic debris, I mean about uh, wood gems and wooden islands, uh, in the multiple reach resulted in the 36 times higher amount of the macroplastic debris in this reach in compari comparison to the surrounding channelized one. If we, if we see on this uh, picture, the amount of macroplastic stored per one kilometer of multi-thread reach is similar to those uh, who uh, Lisa Watkins uh, documented for the uh, trapping by uh, OER, if I co uh, correct, uh, correctly understood. So uh, differences is quite huge and also amount is quite significant. Uh, one practical implication from our observation is that uh, river, future river cleaning action should be focused on the multiple beach of mountain rivers. And in the more lo local scale, we especially should focus on the wood gems and wooden islands, which trap uh, significantly more macroplastic debris than the rest of the surfaces which occur in a mountain river channel. Uh, this is all from me. More information about our uh, results is available on the preprint, which I link at here. Thank you for your attention and future question. I save some time for them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Machi. Uh, we will now move to our final presenter for this press briefing. Um, Mishu, if you're ready for your presentation, over to you. Thank you, Julian. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Yingxue. Uh, I just recently completed my PhD at Washington State University. And then my study mainly focuses on microplastic pollution in soil. Today, I'm presenting microplastics and soil hydraulic properties. First, let's look at plastic of the world. It's been reported that between 1950 and 2015, 8.3 billion tons of plastic were produced, and among all of them, the majority is single-use plastic product. And then this single-use pl plastic product is mostly simply thrown away, which means they end up in our environment. As the two former speakers have mentioned, we can see them everywhere in rivers, in lands. And then waste that much plastic waste inappropriately disposed in our environment, we see plastic pollution. First, the plastic pollution not only contaminate our environment, like the left figure shown here, the river is completely covered with plastic waste. The plastic also threatens our ecosystem. Like seabirds, they eat up plastic as food, which takes up their intestinal space, cause impeded growth or even death. Some sea turtles, they can be easily entangled by discarded plastic waste, which reduces their mobility, leading to starvation. Other than these macroscopic effects, they actually are also seeing some microscopic effect that's from micro nanoplastics. Micro nanoplastics are the eventual product of these microscopic, macroscopic plastic because macroscopic plastic will eventually break down into smaller and smaller pieces and then when they break down into micro nanoplastics, these micro nanoplastics are too tiny to be seen by our naked eyes, but they can easily get into animals' body or even be taken up by plants. Taken up by animals can cause inflammation and tissue damage. Taken up by plants would cause accumulation of micro nanoplastics in the food chain, threaten our food security. 
The two speakers mentioned that rivers are a major receiver of plastic waste, but actually soil is one of the largest plastic pollution reservoir. And agriculture soil is considered to be the largest reservoir of microplastics because it can receive microplastics from sewage sludge application, compost application, and plastic mulching. With so much, so with so many plastic sources, concerns have arisen over the impacts of these microplastics on soil properties. And then in here, we focus on effects of microplastics on soil hydraulic properties because soil hydraulic properties are an essential part for soil to sustain food production. In the study, we use two types of microplastics, including polyester fiber and polypropylene granules. Polyester fiber is a common used plastic for our clothes, and then polypropylene granules. Polypropylene is a commonly used plastic for food packaging, like the plastic cap you can see on these plastic bottles. They are made of polypropylene. And then what we did was to mix these two types of microplastics into soil at different levels of concentration, because we want to see how the concentration of plastic would affect the soil's property. As you can see here, with the concentration of polyester fiber increases, the, the appearance of the soil changes, especially with higher concentration of polyester fibers. But for the polypropylene, you could barely see any changes in the appearance of the soil. Remember that figure. And then what we did was to mirror some hydraulic properties. And we mirrored field capacity, which is the water content for soil to keep when the gravity drains out all the water from the soil. So to simplify that term, if you have a piece of a sponge and then you dip that into the water, you take that out, some water would leak out. What's remained in the sponge would be the field capacity. Another hydraulic property is the permanent wilting point, which is the point where plant cannot suck up any water from the soil. And the difference between these two is plant available water, which is the amount of water that a soil can sustain plants to grow. Other than directly marrying the hydraulic properties of the soil freshly mixed with microplastics, we also did some experiments to look at natural weathering effect what we did was to weather plastics in solar simulator and then mix some weathered plastics into soil and then weather and then expose the soil microplastic mixture in the field for 50 days because that's what naturally would happen if microplastics end up in our soil environment. Here is our results. So the pristine treatment is directly mirrored after mixing the microplastic with soil. The weather treatment is the natural weathering effect. And then we can see that on the left axis, uh, on the horizontal axis, is plastic treatment concentration. On the y axis, is the plant available water. So we can see that plant available water decreases as polyester fiber concentration increases. But for polypropylene granules, we barely can see any change. And then the difference between the pristine and weather treatment is a little bit, but not very pronounced. We can see that the weather has a lower water available, uh, has a lower content of plant available water, meaning that weathering effect could cause soil to lose more water. The most important thing is this decrease in plant available water as polyester fiber concentration increases. But the decrease is only pronounced for higher concentrations of polyester fiber. And then we go back to the appearance of the soil. We can see this one is the soil itself. If we mix 0.94% of polyester fiber into the soil, we see the soil already becomes, becomes some um, cluster formed. And then with 1.9% 
99% of polyester fiber, the soil becomes some bulbs. These types of appearance, we can never be, we can never see them in the nature, which means although microplastics, especially polyester fiber, has the potential to decrease plant available water, but the effect is unlikely to be seen, at least for now, with the with the current um, with the current concentration of microplastic pollution in our soil. But we should be alerted because more microplastics and more pl plastic waste is generated and disposed into our environment. So with that, I would like to close my presentation and take any questions. Thank you so much um, to all of our speakers for those insightful presentations. We now move to the last part of this press conference, which is the question and answer round. So I invite um, questions from journalists both in the room and those who are joining us online. If you have any questions, just to recap, you can either raise your hand or um, if you're joining us virtually, you can use the chat function or raise um, your hand in the Zoom platform and we will come to you for your question. Well, I have a question um, for you. Let me you just finish your, your talk. So you said it might get worse with the time because microplastic or nanoplastic are going to come more and more. But is there any solution at the end to remove them from the soil? Like, do people already think of something? Um, yeah, that's, that's basically my question. Thank you for that question. I think it's a very good one because um, with these negative impacts, we definitely need to do something to address the problem. And then I think the first speaker, Lisa, mentioned a very good point where the community could actually join us to solve the problem. And then the problem should be solved at the source, which means we can't discuss, uh, discard all these plastic waste just randomly into our environment. And then with, with the reduced plastic discarded in the environment, I think we can lower the concentration of microplastic and nanoplastics in the environment, and thus we would expect less impacts of them. Thank you. Do we have any other questions that are coming in? We'll just wait for another couple of few seconds do you have yeah i question? have like a follow-up question but i think all of the um, participants can answer or give their comments to it but um will it not be more efficient to just reduce the plastic at the source like produce less plastic instead of trying to deal with the plastic that are arriving every year so i don't know is there some way for the community to maybe put all of the voices together and ask for less plastic production would you like a given speaker to um, answer that first? Just oh, so that I don't know. Maybe Lisa, as she is dealing with microplastic in the community. Sure. I think you've kind of hit the nail on the head there. We have obviously been in the field seeing just so much plastic, large stuff, small stuff. Um, and I think it's becoming very clear from the science that it is overwhelming our ability to deal with it and that the solution here is to reduce the amount that we are introducing into the environment. And I think that when people see plastic pollution, you know, on their streets or see a picture of a whale with plastic in their stomachs, it can feel like a really overwhelming issue for individuals. Um, and often they're turning to, you know, banning straws or refusing plastic bags at their grocery store, which are wonderful things. Um, but I think the problem here is even larger. And the solution, as you've mentioned, is really um, bringing people together, um, finding that community groups like in my research are doing the work for their, their communities, um, for their neighbors, that is contributing to the science, contributing to our understanding of identifying interventions that are the most efficient and can be the most targeted with the time that we have, with the energy that we have, I think is really exciting. Um, and I think that uh, it gives people something to do. They can help collect data. They can help um, contribute to these community groups, to these NGOs who are 
who already are established as lobbyists, who are already established in their communities to make changes at the, at the regulatory level, at the um, level of, of their you know, community, of their municipality, of their state, of their country. I think that um, getting plugged in that way and, and to find that, that it's a um, effective measure by getting banded together is exciting. And it gives people a little bit of, of hope and way to get in. Thanks so much, Lisa. All right, so um, I can make some amendments. Oh, sure. Ying Xu has something to add. Yeah, please go I, ahead. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's a, a very good one because um, other than um, like reducing the plastic waste we produce, there is another problem is that we can't live without plastics, which means there is definitely a lot of plastic being generated every year, even though we don't discard them in the environment. And then how do we deal with these generated plastic is, of course, important. There are some facilities already working on recycling plastic waste. Like I know Adidas has been producing plastic bottle made shoes, but that's not a sustainable solution because when you wear these shoes, these shoes would, of course, get um, like degrading or something, and then these microplastics would still eventually end up in our environment, cause a problem over time. And then another sustainable solution would be to use biodegradable plastics, because biodegradable plastics would eventually convert into carbon dioxide, water, biomass, these natural products, and then which means we are not introducing any man-made so, uh, man-made persistent plastic products into the environment and then biodegradable plastic is a area where a lot of potentials can be found thank you thank you so much for adding that i think it's um not an overwhelming solution even like lisa said um it's something that you know each one of us can do so if, if i can i would like to sure add something uh, we are talking about uh, cutting the plastic from the sources. It is obviously the, the best option. But if we take into account how much plastic is now stored in the, for example, in river floodplains globally, even if we will be able to cut all sources of new plastic, this plastic which is now stored in the fluvial sediment will be with us for the new few hundred years. So. Uh, definitely the best option will be to cut plastic from the sources, but even those we will be not free of plastic for future few hundred years, I think, because uh, this plastic which is now stored will be remobilized during floods. And the story is not so uh, easy to solve, in my opinion, like only cutting the sources, but obviously this is the first thing we should do. Thank you, Maji. All right. Um, do we have any other questions? Okay, so I think we are ready to then um, wrap up this press conference as we are now coming to a close. Um, thank you so much again for joining us all for this briefing. If you find yourself struggling to connect to any of our speakers today, um, for interviews or comments, you can simply drop me an email at media at egu.eu and I'll do my best to connect you. Um, we have um, our last and final press conference today at 3.30, which is an exclusive NASA press briefing. So be sure to check out the media.egu.eu page for more information. Thank you once again. <laughs>